Hello and a very warm welcome to our panel on degrowing the food sector, how to build democratic food policies. My name uh, is Juliana Fehlinger and I have the pleasure to guide you through this panel this morning. Um, this panel is going to be in English and uh, one of our guests speaking in German. Um, für alle, die Deutsch sprechen, um, gibt es eine Übersetzung im a Translation Theater. Ihr könnt dieses auf Discord finden. Ihr müsst nur dort auf den Link klicken und in diesem Raum da, euch stumm schalten. Und dieser Link wird jetzt im Channel, äh, im Chat gepostet. Uh, so this was just a um, translation for translation issues for those people who just who follow us in German. And um, I welcome all the attendees from all over Europe and from many other parts of the world who are in this uh, wonderful conference. Um, there is a harvesting uh, channel for all of you who want to help us to harvest whatever um, is said in this conference, all uh, everything you want to share with us. And the link for this uh, channel is uh, also shared with you in the in the chat now. And there is also we ha today we have a whole day on uh, discussions about um, degrowing the food sector, and we're now starting with this panel. Um, and there are also a lot of other um, workshops and so on. And there's uh, one room for in order to exchange. Food issues in um, Sorry, I have just um, some other noises. Um, then um, I am speaking to you from Vienna, from the um, where the conference is hosted, and I want to introduce at the beginning myself. And then our, all our guests, our speakers. I'm working for Via Campesina Austria, which is a network of uh, small scale farmers, land workers, landless people. And uh, one of our guests, Jenny Vief, is also from Via Campesina and she will say a lot more about this network. I'm also um, within ATAC, the ATAC network, uh, which is also co hosting this conference. And I used to work uh, in agriculture myself on a collective farm and in, on alpine summer pastures. And um, I'm really glad to introduce you now to our guests, our uh, speakers um, from very different parts of Europe. Um, first of all, uh, Olivier de Schutte. Um, he's um, a professor at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium and also at the Science Po in Paris. And he was a UN Special Rapporteur on the right of to food between 2008 and 2014. And he's a member of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights between 2015 and 2020. And now in just in May 2020, he resigned from this position to accept the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Very welcome to, Ms., uh, to Olivier de Schutte. Um, then one of our other guests is Line Rice Nielsen. She is uh, the Food Policy Director of the Copenhagen Food Systems Center. And it is an international lab sustainable food systems investigating how to establish systemic change throughout the range of actors reaching from farm to political level. Just a second for my tech team. Um, yeah, and then there are some another two guests I really wa warmly want to welcome. It's Armin Bernhard. He's speaking to us from uh, Bozen. He's part active in the Citizens Cooperative in Mals in south of Tyrol in Italy. 
and he works at the University of Bozen for on the topics of social agriculture. Mars is known for its struggle um, for a pesticide-free region, and I Armin mean, will, of course, speak a lot about that. And last but not least, I want to say welcome to Geneviève Savigny. She's um, a peasant in the south of France, and she's also involved in the European coordination of Via Campesina, working there on agriculture and food uh, policies, and of course also the trade policies. And she's a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. Um, and the aim of our panel uh, today is to somehow develop a common understanding how to social how to establish a socially and ecological sustainable food system and how it could look like um, and how we can build up uh, democratic food policies um, to achieve um, these sustainable uh, food systems. And of course, we want to interconnect that with the debates on degrowth. Um, and this is um, what we would want to discuss with our panelists today. Um, there's um, just some words before we start with the keynote of Olivier. Um, I just want to say that for our organizing team and for uh, all the people who are in the background, we discussed a lot who we want to uh, invite to this panel. And for us, it was so important to say, well, there is so much evidence that we need a really fundamentally transformation um, in the whole food sector. And, um, and we need this transformation on all kinds of different levels. And this is why we invited people from working on the UN level, on the EU level, on the city level, also a transforming whole regions for sustain to sustainable agriculture and also people who know a lot on what kind of transformation is needed on the farms itself. Um, so I also, before we start, I want to um, say thanks also for my team who works in the background. First of all, the IT support, the translation support, and also the people who uh, prepared this uh, panel with me. So thanks a lot to all of you. Um, yeah, so I now want to give the word to Olivier. Um, Olivier is, uh, you are the co-chair of the international panel of the exports system, which is called IPES Food. And uh, you're in this work, um, you're, you uh, focus on how we can break out of this uh, industrial food and farming system. And together with farmers, food entrepreneurs, science activists, scientists, policy makers, and you formulated this vision of food policy for Europe. So can you introduce us to the aims of IPIS Food and um, why do we need this food policy so urgently? And maybe you can also give us some already some links to the degrowth debate. Okay, well, thank you very much, Juliana, for this introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to be there with uh, uh, Lina Riese, Armin, and, and Genevieve on this panel. Um, perhaps I should uh, preface by, by saying that uh, the proposals that were uh, developed over the past few years to change the orientation of the food systems are based on a diagnosis about what is wrong with the choices we've made over the past uh, 50 or 60 years. And indeed, it is a great pleasure for me to participate in this panel under the heading of the degrowth paradigm, because uh, one part of the problem and one reason why the food systems need to be reformed is because they've been obsessively um, um, dedicated to growing um, the, the, the ability for the system to produce large volumes uh, by using a range of uh, uh, techniques and, and business models uh, that um, may have succeeded in a way in 
in increasing um, the availability of food on the market, but have produced a number of negative externalities that now cannot be ignored anymore. In fact, the food systems that we have have been developed since the post Second World War and in Europe, the start of the common agricultural policy in, in 1958 um, is uh, symptomatic of this approach um, at a time when the real concern was to increase food production to match demographic growth and changing diets. So many efforts were put in increasing the ability for the for the food system to produce large volumes without any consideration for environmental impacts, for nutrition dimensions, and for the ability for relatively smaller size farms to survive in an increasingly competitive environment. And so what we've seen is um, a range of impacts that um, have been the result of these choices. Um, from the environmental point of view, the industrial food systems that have been encouraged have resulted in increasing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing agrobiodiversity at the same time, reducing the ability for soils to capture uh, carbon, to function as carbon sinks. All this is the result of the agronomic techniques that have been encouraged in the name of increasing production. Uh, secondly, we have, as I mentioned, a large number of farms that were forced to disappear. In countries such as Belgium and France, two thirds of the farms have disappeared over the past uh, 30 years. And it's mostly the smaller farms that disappear because they are less well equipped to achieve economies of scale, to be competitive on global markets, and to satisfy the expectations of the big buyers that dominate global supply chains. And thirdly, we have witnessed um, a series of health consequences from these choices. Um, in many countries of the EU, the rates of um, overweight and obesity are increasing, largely as a result of our diets uh, being far more dependent than in the past on heavily processed foods, processed through industrial means, and um, people are, have less time to cook fresh foods and, and thus to have nutritious and healthy diets. So that is the diagnosis and that is the system we must break away from. Now, IPES Food, the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, has indeed developed um, a broad campaign in the years 2016-2019 focused on the EU in order to convince the EU to adopt an integrated, comprehensive, common food policy. And what was interesting in this campaign is that we managed to bring together groups that in the past had not been working together. Um, for example, environmental NGOs, um, Via Campesina and other farmers' organizations, um, uh, consumer groups, um, um, development NGOs working on the relationship between uh, North and South, um, and other such groups that have different agendas, have different priorities, but have a common interest in reshaping food systems for greater sustainability. And what we basically claimed was that the EU should dedicate its efforts in the future to achieve much greater coherence between the different sectorial policies of the EU that affect food, the agricultural policy, of course, but also the environmental policy, the health policy, the employment policy, the trade and investment policies, all these policies we asserted need to be reconciled, brought together under a single framework, under a single umbrella of a common food policy. And we insisted on this because we felt that these policies were not well aligned with one another, were often contradicting each other, and certainly were not supporting um, themselves mutually. So, for example, the common, the common agricultural policy of the EU still um, primarily provides um, subsidies to farmers based on the amount of land that they have under their control. So the bigger you are, the more subsidies you obtain. But that is leading to an inflated price of land, making it difficult for a young generation of farmers to emerge 
and it is also um, not sufficiently supporting the farmers that try to practice um, agroecological types of farming and try to deliver what we um, uh, call ecosystem services um, that uh, maintain soil health and preserve and enhance agrobiodiversity. And the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, is just one of many examples of these incoherences in the system. We also were struck in our diagnosis by the fact that many cities or regions in the EU are trying to develop local food systems, to relocalize, to re-territorialize food systems, linking producers to the eaters, linking the farmers to the uh, to the to the consumers, but these cities and regions trying to relocalize food systems were not supported by the policies developed at the national level of the member states or at the EU level. Those levels of governance mostly prioritize large scale production, um, competitive um, um, a competitive environment in which all producers are meant to compete for the same markets and they seek to homogenize and uniformize rather than um, betting on diversity. And in general, the trend within the EU has been for each region, each country to specialize in growing a relatively narrow range of food commodities in order to buy from other parts of the EU or to import from outside the EU what cannot be produced locally. Instead, what we try to assert is that each region, each country should diversify its production, should produce more of what it consumes and should consume more of what it produces. But those cities we worked with, those regions we worked with, felt that they were not supported by the higher levels of governance. And there is a tension between this attempt to relocalize food systems and the policies developed at um, higher levels of governance, including in particular the EU. A third part of our diagnosis is that we need to manage a transition from the current productivist approach to an approach that um, puts a premium on sustainability and tries to achieve um, this relocalization and this diversification of food systems. For this, we need specific governance tools. We need multi-year action plans. We need indicators of progress. We need monitoring of progress to make sure that governments deliver on their promises. And we need to coordinate change across different sectorial policies. For example, it makes no sense to encourage producers to shift to agroecology or to sustainable types of farming if you don't, on the other hand, change the consumer's behavior, or if you don't encourage local collectivities, schools, administrations to source from local farmers that rely on agroecological methods of production. What we do at the level of production should correspond to what we do at the level of consumption um, uh, demand. And so we need a coordinated change across different segments of the food chain. And we were very delighted that when in December 2019, the European Commission proposed its Green Deal, it mentioned as part of this large policy initiative, a new farm to fork strategy to move to sustainable food systems. And um, just a few days ago on 20th of May, the Commission presented its farm to fork strategy. The full title is a farm to fork strategy for a fair, healthy, and environmental friendly food system. And the communication presented by the, by the commission is very encouraging in certain respects. First, it adopts a chain way, chain wide approach from the farm, the producer to the fork, the consumer. So it looks at the food system in a holistic manner, which is very encouraging. Um, secondly, it recognizes that consumers um, um, should be helped in making the right responsible choices. There's a, uh, there's a strong emphasis in the farm to fork strategy on the food environment having to be changed. By this, uh, the commission means 
all that influences our eating behaviors should be rethought, reshaped. In other terms, the responsible choices from the consumer should be made easy and affordable. And thirdly, um, importantly, the farm to fork strategy recognizes that the common agricultural policy that is to be reformed and the commission presented proposals on this already in June 2018, that the common agricultural policy should be reformed in the light of the farm to fork strategy so that um, the two agendas are aligned with one another. However, there are still major omissions in the farm to fork strategy that has been presented. And I look forward to the comments of Geneviève Savigny on this. My own view is that there are four major omissions. First, there is no emphasis in the farm to fork strategy on food governance, on food democracy, and there's no questioning of the growth paradigm that is still dominating the Green Deal agenda for Europe. The Green Deal is presented explicitly, in fact, as a new growth strategy. So the idea of increasing the GDP, the idea of um, expanding the economy, the idea of um, providing new market opportunities for the big players is not questioned, although the growth should move in a different direction, the paradigm of growth is still not questioned as such. That's the first major omission. Secondly, there is a weak link to the external dimension of EU policies, i.e. the trade dimension. At the same time that in the EU we are moving towards this Green Deal, we are encouraging states to ratify the EU Mercosur Agreement. We are announced, uh, we are told by Phil Hogan, the Commissioner for Trade of the EU, that negotiations will be launched with the US um, on this um, um, new trade and investment partnership with the US um, to boost um, export opportunities. And we have trade policies that are not linked to environmental, social conditions, so that we expose our own producers to unfair competition from abroad. And to me, this misalignment between what is done internally and the external trade policies we pursue is a major source of concern. It's a major incoherence. Thirdly, we pay too little attention in the farm to fork strategy to social innovations, community supported agriculture, um, urban gardening, vegetable gardens that are developed by local communities, um, the, um, the development of um, agreements between the big retailers and the NGOs, the charities that provide food aid to low-income families. All these social innovations are very important. The food systems are being reinvented every day at the local level by alternative food networks developing. But rather than seeing this as an opportunity that should be encouraged and rather than seeing the obstacles to these innovations having to be removed, the farm to fork strategy is entirely silent about this. So there's a big focus on the mainstream food system, but no attention being paid to these social innovations that, however, in my view, announce the future of food systems. Fourth and finally, most importantly, I think for us, there is no explicit recognition in the farm to fork strategy of the dilemma or the choice to be made between the approach that is dominant today in which um, we have uh, developed a low cost food economy um, to provide cheap but poor quality calories to families in poverty on the one hand and on the other hand an approach that would say all families have a right to adequate diets, diversified diets, fresh foods they may cook at home at an affordable price, which means social protection, which means a decent um, level at which minimum wages uh, legislation should, uh, should be imposed, and which means basically that low cost food options are not a substitute for robust social protection policies. That dilemma is still not addressed, and the idea that cheap food is a solution for people in poverty is still 
very much um, an idea that is not questioned. And so I think these are four major gaps or omissions in the farm to fork strategy. I close by three final remarks that link this debate on food to the broader debate on, on growth. Um, first, I think that we have not yet succeeded in linking the short term imperative of addressing the crisis that the food system um, is going through to the long-term vision we want to achieve. And the reactions to the COVID-19 crisis is very, are very typical. We try to facilitate the movement of seasonal migrant workers. We try to avoid uh, um, foodstuffs being blocked at the borders. We try to, if you will, save the system from being um, um, under threat of disruption as a result of the crisis. But we do not link this to the need to relocalize, re-territorialize food systems and diversify production in different regions. So the link between the short term and the long term is still not done. And for this, we need, as I said, new governance tools. Secondly, um, we um, have not succeeded in linking the social and ecological transition within the EU to our policies vis-a-vis -vis the outside world. Again, if we adopted trade policies that were really consistent with the values we pursue at home, we would be sending a very powerful message to unions, to NGOs, to social movements in the global south, in Brazil, in India, in South Africa, in the Philippines, saying the EU will support imports that are um, uh, sustainable by imposing social environmental conditionalities in trade policies, and this is a way to support you in your struggles at home in order to encourage Brazil, South Africa, India, the Filipinos, for example, to move to sustainable development. That is not something we have dared to do yet. And the European Commission, particularly DG Trade, is still not keen to use the very strong power the EU has to contribute to humanizing globalization. Thirdly and finally, and that's my last remark, we certainly need to link the ecological transition to the social transition, to social justice, to the reduction of inequalities. That link is one that is indispensable, not only for the ecological transition to be legitimate and accepted by the population, but also because the more we can reduce inequalities, the more we can combat poverty, the less growth will be presented as the only way um, we can um, um, uh, reduce, uh, reduce poverty. To put things differently, if we have um, less inequality, you don't need more growth to reduce poverty. Uh, you can do this by redistributive policies that um, um, ensure that all people have access to an adequate diet and that at the same time, food producers have a decent remuneration for their work. So I think this link between the ecological and the social transition is one that is really important to maintain. I'll stop here and I would like to thank you for your attention. I look forward to our debate. Okay, thanks uh, Olivier. Um, I think this was a very good insight and overview on uh, our debate uh, to this morning. And I want to uh, give the word now to uh, Lina Rice nielsen um, she's uh, the policy director of Changing Food and um, also part uh, was also part of the House of Food, um, a network or you will say a lot more on how you established to have more or even 90% of organic food in the public procurement in Copenhagen. Um, your Copenhagen is quite known for that already and today as uh, and this is also a project that is integrating the ecological aspects and also social aspects as Olivier al already pointed out is so important and so maybe you can uh, introduce us to what uh, changing food in the house of food is doing and how you managed to um, organize it th that for the whole city um, and you yeah and how how does it really works mm -hmm. yes Thank you very much, Yolanda. I'm very thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel. I'm very happy to be here. Um, the story about Copenhagen House of Food started 12 years ago 
with the, this lady. I, I brought you a picture of it. Her name is Rit Biergo, and she was a former um, Minister of Food and Agriculture, and she's also been former EU Commissioner in Agriculture. So when she became Lord Mayor of the Copenhagen Municipality, she already knew a lot about food and, and understood the connection between what you put on your plate and what the farmer's uh, uh, place is in, in this food system. And uh, in Copenhagen, the system is um, organized. So the Copenhagen municipality has the responsibility for uh, 900 kitchens, all the way from um, the childcare, uh, zero to three years old, uh, kindergartens, schools, uh, employers, canteen, or all the uh, people working in Copenhagen municipality, uh, elderly homes, uh, home, elderly still living at home, but getting food from the municipality, and uh, leisure and culture houses where they also provide food. So it's a lot of kitchens, and it's a lot of employees, 1,800 employees, and 70,000 meals a day that the Copenhagen uh, municipality is organizing. And actually, when uh, uh, this Lord Mayor Ritbjergo uh, started her uh, term, she said that she didn't want, again, to see a headline in the newspaper with a picture of bad food for elderly. Uh, she wanted it to stop, so she wanted to raise the quality and be proud of what she was serving for the people who needed it from the municipality. So we tried to, we, the journey started with uh, prioritizing quality, uh, and we started to measure the, the meals by um, five indicators. What was the raw material? What was the culinary quality? Were there respect for the meal? Uh, was it the right food for the right people and job satisfaction? And um, uh, I tried to yeah, get a starting point on what, what was the picture in Copenhagen. There was a, a huge amount of processed food. So in the kitchens, all the employees actually uh, used their scissors and, and were uh, opening bags with pre-prepared food and warming it up and processing it to the elderly um, or to the school, food, uh, school pupils. Um, the culinary quality was so low, so we, when we asked the, the kitchen personnel if they wanted to eat the food themselves, 60% of them answered no. Um, there was no focus on the meal. It was just uh, something to a service you had to provide during the day, but you didn't use it as a time to connect with the people eating. Uh, and sixty percent was malnourished, um, especially be, be, uh, among the elderly people. Uh, the the food was measured in in terms of nutrition, but the elderly didn't eat it. So it's it's first nutrition when you eat um, the food. And um, and they didn't for for various reasons, mostly because it didn't taste or wasn't presented very um, nice. Uh, so it, it it went to this malnourishment. And then there was the job satisfaction. We had uh, um, ten percent of the workforce. Um, ten percent of the time they were sick uh, in the kitchens. So it was a, a huge problem with the with the. Uh, employees that they actually did not like their jobs very well and, and had no uh, pride in going to work. Uh, so we tried to actually step in in all of these uh, parameters, uh, measurements, um, and we found that it's very, very difficult to go into a professional kitchen and tell them that they didn't prepare very nice food. And actually, um, at the same time, the municipality had this strategy to raise the uh, use of organic produce and we could use that as a as a tool to have a talk in the kitchens and how to uh, prepare some food that were uh, very different um, the goal in Copenhagen municipality was to raise the bar to 60 percent organic food without uh, changes in the budget and and Copenhagen house of food uh, developed um, um, a method to uh, to analyze the kitchens in the potential in transferring to organic, and the most uh, obvious uh, um, method was to go from processed food from the bags and go to raw produce 
organic fresh raw produce in season and more um, vegetables and meat uh, and looking in other ways to get the proteins from the meat in, in lentils and such on. And by doing so, we had to cheat the kitchen personnel to, to cook from scratch. And a lot of them couldn't. And I know it sounds strange for people in France and Italy because we I met kitchen personnel in public kitchen there and everybody knows how to make food. But in Denmark, the food culture is so poor. So uh, they actually didn't know how to how to 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 make food from scratch. Um, so the 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 method of coming house of food actually developed was a education program for all the 1800 people uh, where we learned them how to cook from scratch, how to think in in an ecological way so they understood what was we went to organic farmers so they could see how when how it was produced, what difference did it make to make organic produce, um, and and understanding the seasons and, and the connection between the city and the land, actually. Um, this, this means that the quality... I, I always say that you can't taste if a carrot is organic or not, but you can uh, taste if it's processed beforehand and peeled beforehand and uh, pre-cooked. So you can you can taste homemade food, and and that is actually the quality race we made in the kitchen. That it is 100% from raw produce, and it's uh, it's uh, there's a respect from the meal. They they understand why to take care of it, why to um, to secure that there's a low amount of food waste. Um, and now we have uh, made people eat the food because they like it. It smells good. It's there's a it's a proper meal, um, and because of that, the, the rate for malnourishment have uh, fallen, and the job satisfaction have risen. So it's it sounds uh, quite like a, a, a I don't know. It's I, I think it's a very easy method when I explain it like this. But it's it's of course uh, engineer work to find the potential, understanding the kitchens. Uh, to be sure that they still make food within the nutritional demands from the Nordic counseling um, and, and, and be respectful about the people working in the kitchen. But it can be done. And um, I, am, I think there's a very strong connection between what is the public meals and what are the public agenda or the, the governance agenda on how, which kind of land and, and agriculture you want in the nation. So, but I will come back to that in, a, in the later questions. So just for now, I, I was um, explaining how a Copenhagen House of Food work. And just for clearing it up, uh, Copenhagen House of Food unfortunately closed down in November last year. And uh, together with uh, some colleagues from Copenhagen House of Food, I have started this new company, Changing Food where we continue uh, working with this uh, method and continue to, um, to, um, to share it with the rest of the world. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Alina, um, to, yeah, to, introduce, uh, you, uh, to introduce us to your amazing work. I think it seems to be pretty easy if you present it like that, but we all know that there's a lot behind that, a lot of work, a lot of con uh, trying to convince people and uh, what was so important for us and uh, why I also want to say thank you for the work you're doing is and to all of you who are in the in the panel um, that it's we also need to focus on what where we can win and where we can really transform the food system and not only on what is going wrong and this is so powerful in the work you're all doing. Um, I just forgot to say some uh, technical stuff. Um, first of all, of course, uh, we will what, want to ask you to ask questions on the chat. Um, just feel free to ask them now. There are uh, there is my team in the background who cluster the questions, and we will ask them to the panelists at the, uh, like the end of the session. And this whole session is also recorded, so if you really like what we're talking about, you can also share the recording afterwards on, uh, with a YouTube link. Um, then I want to come to Armin uh, Bernhardt. 
He is the chair of the Citizens Cooperative of, uh, uh, of Mals in so south of Tyrol in Italy. And um, Mals is very known for its struggle for a pesticide-free uh, village, um, which is really also amazing and uh, incredible what you're doing. And it's really a button-up strategy. Maybe some of you saw the film uh, Das Wunder von Mals. And uh, maybe you can introduce us, I mean, to uh, what is um, the Citizens Cooperative doing now and what um, also maybe to give us some idea of this uh, struggle of mass. And Armin will speak in German, so for the English speakers, don't worry, we will translate it to English. Hello, good morning. Ich würde gerne eine Geschichte aus dem Leben erzählen, aus Malz, weil sich in Malz schlussendlich die globalen Konfliktfelder, die Diskussionspunkte alle im Kleinen spiegeln. Okay, so good morning everyone. I would like to tell a story from my life um, and I think it's good because it, in Mals really all the global conflicts um, come together and they all play out in this really small context. Mals ist ein kleiner Ort im oberen Finchgau. Der untere Finchgau ist geprägt von einer intensiven Landwirtschaft, Apfelmonokulturen mit hohem Pestizideinsatz. Der obere Finchgau Hingegen war davon nicht betroffen, aber aufgrund des zunehmenden Klimawandels war es immer mehr möglich, auch im oberen Finchgau intensive Obstplantagen anzubauen. Okay, so uh, Malz is a small uh, village in the upper Finchgau and uh, the lower Finchgau is a region which is famous for um, its apple production, which has a high pesticide concentration. Um, and this was formerly not possible in the upper Finchgau, but due to climate change and the changing climate now, it's also possible to um, to cultivate apples with pesticides in the upper Finchgau. Dies führte vor Ort zu unterschiedlichen Konfliktfeldern. Das erste Konflikt ist das Thema der Intensivierung. Menschen, die keine Intensivierung der Landwirtschaft wollen, mit den Nebeneffekten Ausbeutung des Bodens, Externalisierungseffekten, Verminderung der Vielfalt, der ökologischen Vielfalt, gegenüber einer, einer, einer Landwirtschaftslobby, die eigentlich eine Industrialisierung der Landwirtschaft möchte. Mm -hmm. So there is different um, kinds of conflicts. The first conflict is the intensivization of um, agriculture. Um, so there's on the one side the people who don't want the exploitation of the soil, um, they don't want the externalization of certain processes and they want to um, protect the biodiversity of the land. And on the other hand, um, the people that want to um, industrialize agriculture. Ist das richtig? Der zweite Konflikt betrifft das Thema Spekulation und Landgrabbing im Kleinen. Auf dem Boden die Intensivierung der Landwirtschaft bedeutet, dass die Bodenpreise steigen und dass sich lokale Bauern, kleine Bauern, kleine Biobauern sich Grund und Boden nicht mehr leisten können. Mm -hmm. So the second conflict is, is speculation. And um, if you intensivize uh, agriculture and um, the land use, then the land prices rise. And that means that smaller farmers can no longer afford land in the region. Der dritte Konflikt ist in Nachbarschaftskonflikte zwischen Landwirten. Wenn ein, wir haben sehr viele kleine strukturierte Felder und die intensive Landwirtschaft mit einem hohen Einsatz von Pestiziden und in der Nachbarschaft biologische Betriebe, Betriebe mit Getreide, mit Grünfutter, können nebeneinander nicht existieren, weil es nicht möglich ist, Pestizide auszubringen, sie auf den Feldern zu belassen, wo man sie hinbringen möchte. Mm -hmm. So the third conflict is um, uh, our neighborhood conflicts um, because in the region most farmers have very small fields and they're all very close to each other and if you have um, farmers who do organic farming and then right next to it you have those who use intensivized um, agriculture with lots of pesticides it's not possible to contain the pesticides um, on one field so that you have spillover effects to those who also who want to engage in um, organic agriculture. 
Das vierte Konfliktfeld ist das Thema Gesundheit. Chemisch-synthetische Pestizide beeinträchtigen die Gesundheit nicht nur der Landwirte, die es ausbringen, sondern auch der gesamten Bevölkerung und der Gäste, die auch Urlaub. Um, so the first, fourth uh, conflict is health, because chemical synthesized pesticides don't only um, endanger the health of the farmers, but also of the whole population in the region and the guests uh, and the tourists who come to the region um, on their holiday. Weil intensive Landwirtschaft, und das betrifft die Bio, intensive Biolandwirtschaft ebenso, intensive Landwirtschaft verändert Land, Landschaft. Intensive Apfelmonokulturen mit Hagelnetzen, mit Betonstangen beeinträchtigen die Landschaft, das Bild und damit auch das Lebensgefühl der Menschen, die dort leben. Um, another conflict is um, the landscape, because intensive um, agriculture changes the landscape, no matter whether it's organic or kind of industrial. Um, so, for example, for the apple, um, apple cultivation, you have um, sticks and nets in the ground uh, over the fields or the um, yes over the fields so that really changes the way the landscape looks und der nächste konflikt ist das thema der demokratie wer kann bestimmen wer kann festlegen was in einer landschaft passiert was mit einer landschaft gemacht werden darf es ist ein demokratischer prozess ein demokratischer konflikt wer kann mitreden um, and then there's the conflict of democracy, who decides um, who can change things in the landscape and who can change the, uh, who can change the way it looks. Um, and it should be a democratic process. Um, so the question really is who has a voice in this discussion. Und uh, das waren ein paar der zentralen Konfliktfelder. Vor gut zehn Jahren hat eine Gruppe von Freunden eigentlich beschlossen, sich zusammengesetzt und äh, gesagt, sie wollen diese Konfliktfelder in der Gesellschaft thematisieren, weil sie alle betreffen und deshalb nicht nur die Landwirtschaft über die Landschaft entscheiden soll, sondern eigentlich sollen alle mitreden dürfen. Mm -hmm. um, so ten years ago a group of friends really um, sat down together and they decided that they want to talk about all of these um, fields of conflicts that were just mentioned because they believe that it really concerns everyone in society, not just the farmers. Um, so everyone should have a voice in this discussion. Es ging darum nicht zu sagen, was gut oder richtig ist, sondern aufzuzeigen, dass schleichende Veränderungsprozesse nicht wahrgenommen werden erst bald, sobald der Veränderungsprozess abgeschlossen ist. Und dass es aus dem Grund wichtig ist, im Vorfeld zu überlegen, in welcher Landschaft wollen wir leben? Wie wollen wir leben? Wie wollen wir gemeinsam wirtschaften? Wie wollen wir mit uns und mit der Natur umgehen? Mm -hmm. So, um, this discussion really shouldn't be about what is good or what is bad. It's more the fact that really slow processes of change are not noticed until they're finished. Um, so it's important to talk about them beforehand and really discuss how do we want to live, um, what do we want our landscape to look like, how do we want to, um, how does, do we want our economy to run and how do we want to live together with our environment and nature. Robert Musil sprach, dass es neben dem Wirklichkeitssinn auch einen Möglichkeitssinn gibt. Und demzufolge war es dieser Gruppe wichtig, diesen Möglichkeitssinn zu entwickeln. Und zwar aufzuzeigen, wie könnte der obere Finchgau ein Ort des Paradieses sein. Des Paradieses, an dem alle Menschen gut leben können. Und aus diesem Grund ging es darum, äh, Paradiesfeste zu veranstalten, Paradiestage und die Leute einzuladen in einer kulturellen Auseinandersetzung über die eigene Zukunft, über die Zukunft des oberen Finchgaus zu diskutieren. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a quote by Robert Musel which says there is not only a sense of reality but also a sense of possibility. Um, so the aim of this initiative was really to talk about how can the Upper Finchgau be a paradise. So they organized events and festivals uh, where they invited the community to discuss how the Upper Finchgau can become a paradise. Es war uns wichtig auch den Raum ein Stück weit zu definieren, weil in einer äh, 
globalisierten Welt, in einer grenzenlosen Welt, das Empire, das gezeichnet ist, so wie Hart und Negri skizzieren von den Fäden, damit geht auch Verantwortung verloren. Und damit ich Menschen in die Verantwortung bringen kann, ist es wichtig, dass ich die Grenzen dieser Verantwortung festlegen kann. Und indem ich mich auf einen, ein Territorium beziehe, auf einen, ein Gebiet, das, sagen wir mal, flüssig abgegrenzt ist, dann haben die Menschen die Möglichkeit, dort ihre Verantwortung zu verorten. Ähm, bei mir ist es gerade eingefroren. Kannst du das nochmal sagen? Tut mir leid. Also das, das Empire von, von Hart und Negri skizziert eine Welt, die, wo die Grenzziehungen fehlen. Mhm. Und in dieser Welt geht Verantwortung verloren. Und damit ich Menschen in die Verantwortung bringen kann, muss ich diese Grenzen irgendwie abstecken. Und deshalb war es uns wichtig, auch uns auf ein Territorium zu beziehen, nicht die Welt zu verändern, sondern im Kleinen zu beginnen. Mm -hmm. um, so, one issue of a globalized borders is that um, you don't have borders or you don't have a defined territory. So it was important for the group to also define this territory and not really have the ambition of changing the whole world, but to start in kind of on a small scale and really um, start the change in this territory or this space that they had defined for themselves. Im Laufe der Diskussionen äh, sind diverse Initiativgruppen entstanden, alle mit unterschiedlichen Ansätzen, alle mit unterschiedlichen Methoden in der Vorgangsweise. Da gab es eine Frauengruppe, die sich recht militant für, Pestiz für Pestizidfreiheit eingesetzt hat. Dann gab es ein Promotorenkomitee, die Ärzte und so weiter. Das Wichtige war, dass unterschiedliche Akteure sich gegenseitig akzeptierten, auch in ihren unterschiedlichen Ansätzen, mit ihren unterschiedlichen Schwerpunkten. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, after this uh, initially started, lots of groups with different initiatives um, formed themselves. For example, there was a women's group who was quite militant in fighting for um, pesticide-free agriculture. There was a group of doctors who um, were more um, on the, were lobbying more for health issues. Um, and the real important thing here was that all the different stakeholders and all the different groups um, were accepting of each other and also of each other's approach, approaches and methods. Unsere Erfahrung ist, dass wir Veränderungsprozesse gestalten können, indem wir unterschiedliche Akteure ihnen den Raum lassen, eigenständig aktiv sein zu können, sich einbringen zu können. Auch wenn man nicht immer dahinter steht, auch wenn nicht alle einer Meinung sind, aber allen die Freiheit belassen, die aus ihrer Sichtweise, aus ihrem Hintergrund heraus gestaltend einzugreifen. Mhm. So for us, um, we've really made the experience that um, processes of change, um, the processes of change uh, work best when there's lots of different actors and lots of different stakeholders and they work independently um, of each other, um, but accept each other's uh, work, even if they're of completely different opinion. And so has sich das, the process im Laufe der Zeit entwickelt, dass im Zuge eines Volksbegehrens 75 Prozent der Bevölkerung sich für eine äh, Region frei von chemisch-synthetischen Pestiziden ausgesprochen hat und die Gemeindeverwaltung den Auftrag bekommen hat, dies umzusetzen. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as this developed, we, it was really successful and there was a citizens um, initiative where in the end 75% of the region voted for a region that was free of pesticides and the municipal government had the um, task to then implement this um, citizens initiative. Und so haben sich dann zwei Wege ergeben. Ein Weg, wie Ulrich Brandt hat das am Freitag definiert, als diese Konflikte der Macht, wo die Gemeinde schlussendlich auf einer rechtlichen Ebene angegriffen wird von der Landesregierung oder von Lobbyistenvertretern der Industrie, Agrarlobby, die vor Gericht das schlussendlich bis in die letzte Instanz ausfechten, darf eine Gemeinde Pestizidfreiheit bestimmen oder nicht. Und auf der anderen Seite die Zivilgesellschaft, 
die eine Bürgergenossenschaft gegründet hat, um auch auf wirtschaftlicher Ebene das umzusetzen, was zuerst nur ideell vorhanden war. Und darüber möchte ich meinen zweiten Punkt diese ein bisschen vorstellen. Mm -hmm. um, so there were two um, things that happened afterwards. One was um, what Ulrich Brandt termed the conflicts of power. So um, the municipality was actually attacked and sued by um, the federal state or the province and by the lobby and by uh, different actors um, who really, and the question really in, in at the, was debated at the court was whether a municipality can decide to become pesticide free. And the second is, um, the second result from this was a citizen's initiative um, that, or a cooperative rather, that formed that wanted to do um, agriculture in a pesticide free and organic way. And if this cooperative. Wenn ich was vergessen habe, sag ich. Ah, ja, oh, yeah, and yeah, he oh. wants to elaborate more on the second part. <laughs> okay, many thanks to Armin um, for. To as to the work you're doing and what uh, why you are uh, organizing so strongly for this pesticide free village and there are, and I think you pointed out quite well that there's a lot of uh, different aspects and problems behind that question um, I'm actually as I expected you you all have a lot to say and so this is why um, we are a bit behind the time and um, I will integrate in the second round the already the questions from the audience which are posted in the chat and um, then um, I will of course also give you the, the, the possibility um, to say what you already prepared for the second question round and so but this is just uh, to ask the audience to already post your questions if you have for the panelists. Um, Genevieve, I think I mean uh, pointed out quite well that this is a really a struggle for for democracy. Um, what he is doing and uh, all uh, also a lot of a lot a lot of other struggles within the food system. And um, I want to ask you to explain us a little more of how the European coordination via Campesina works, what you're do doing, and um, um, what you're focusing. Um, on and how you make the peasant voice heard in the EU policies, um, especially on the common agricultural policy, also trade policies, and as Olivier already asked you, um, also in this uh, new farm to fork strategy, and what do you think about that? Mm. Floor. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you to Olivier de Schutter for setting the scene because he's done a great job of putting things together and giving some uh, clarity into the picture. Uh, maybe I will start uh, a few years ago in the, in the 80s, when the European coordination first started. At, uh, The gap Sorry, discussion. Sorry. Actually, if your quality was quite bad, so we could hardly could could hear you. Maybe you try again to sum it up what you just said. Yes, I, I just I was just summarizing. Um, the European coordination via Campesina. I hope you can hear me and the connection is not too bad. Otherwise, I will switch off the picture and keep only the sound. Yeah, please switch off the video. I think it's uh, pretty bad otherwise. Okay, now we try again. Yes, yeah, so, really sorry. That's a country. Uh, I'm in the middle of the country. Um, so, this, those organizations from different countries gathered because they were sharing the same idea that productivism 
was not good for agriculture, that it was getting too many people out of business, and also that we it was it was not good for the for the environment, uh, and we were proposing also this. USA and so on. So it was really a very important time, and that was the creation of our organization. Um, Genevieve, I'm really sorry, but we hardly hear you. I think it's your connection that is pretty bad, and um, we cannot follow what you're saying because the connection is just so bad. Maybe um, I hand over the question to Olivier, and we will try after Olivier speaking okay. one more time. I'm really sorry for that, but um, it's hard if we can't follow. Um, so, um, just give me a second. Um, there was a quite a lot of um, questions in the chat concerning the farm to fork strategy, um, what you were talking about, and um, I just will read out one of the questions that point, like summarize that quite well. Um, you mentioned that the farm to fork strategy will help um, make responsible choices easy and affordable. This means that we are still discussing food as a commodity. In the degrowth movement, however, we often discuss decommodification. Uh, de Do you see some concrete policies uh, one could suggest to expand the system of universal basic service from mostly being um, about education, health, um, to also include food as one of uh, these uh, basic um, uh, services. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'm very sorry that uh, Geneviève Savigny could not be heard. Um, and I, I do hope uh, she will be able to reconnect and that we can benefit from her inputs in in the questions. Um, look, thank you for this question. It so happens that uh, with my uh, colleagues, um, Jose Luis Vivero, um, Hugo Matei, and Tommaso Ferrando, we published uh, a, a book actually that is called Food as Commons, in which we try to defend the idea that food should not be treated as a commodity, but should be treated as, as a commons, in other terms, uh, uh, democratically governed and um, accessible to, to all without anyone having to face an obstacle resulting from a lack of purchasing power. And I still believe this is uh, indeed a, an important um, um, uh, ideal we should, we should push forward. Now, what we have is indeed an increased recognition that no one should be denied access to adequate diets based on uh, inability to pay and if we take seriously the idea that food should be treated like health, like education, um, that would mean that um, um, much more effort should be put into not just lowering the price of food, because that would be, I think, a wrong-headed approach, uh, but in strengthening the ability for low-income families to have access to food. And, uh, for example, this is... Um, what is done where food is um, uh, provided uh, free of charge or at a very low price in school canteens. In many countries, um, the main meal that children receive is the midday lunch that they receive in schools. And actually, one of the um, quite striking results from the COVID-19 crisis and the closure of schools is that Across the world, some 368 million children have been um, denied access to food because they don't have access to these school meals um, anymore. So um, it is the kind of um, policy uh, that indeed uh, treats food as a, as a commons and decommodifies food. In other terms, does not allow the distribution of food to be um, uh, defined by the purchasing power of, of families. Um, similarly, 
we have programs in which um, uh, with public money um, um, uh, local entities buy from local farmers supporting those small farms and and supporting particularly the farmers practicing low input or organic agriculture and and using this money in order to um, uh, to distribute food uh, to people um, who need it most or to do so in public administrations and schools and so the tool of public purchasing um, uh, programs um, is one also that leads to this decommodification of food I think it's um, it's important to support those social innovations, to support those policies, and to um, to do so um, is important because it's the only way to move beyond the low cost paradigm according to which we've been fun functioning until now. When the only response to the lack of food for people in poverty was to lower the price of food at the expense of the sustainability of how food is produced and at the expense of the ability for farmers to make a decent living from their farming. So that would be my, my answer to this question. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I, we will now try to have uh, Genevieve um, one more time to ask the question one more time to her, and maybe the connection is better now. Um, she already told me before that the connection could be a problem because she's living in the countryside. So, Genevieve, um, can we try one more time if your connection is good and you can, um, yeah, you can answer, like, <clears throat> tell us more about the European Via Campesina and the work to have the peasant war is heard in these EU policies. Well, I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes, but, um, I, was, I was trying to explain that we try to be in the discussion by organizing movement. By being a movement, and it started in the 80s, and then in the 90s, and we uh, was getting very active the struggle against the creation of the WTO that was going to organize all the systems about uh, policies on agriculture. In fact, in uh, there were the I'm very sorry, but yeah. the connection is still very bad. I just asked the technical team if we can work out to have um, yeah to have you on the on a phone call to get you into the uh, on the panel, but um, I think it doesn't work like that. I'm really really sorry for that. Okay. Yeah. Try again. But we will contact you and try to work it out another way. So um, I want to ask now the question to uh, Lina. Um, so what is somehow the, the success formula somehow of the House of Food? We heard that you um, really changed the whole somehow food, the public food system uh, in the city of Copenhagen. And um, maybe you can also tell us how you were influencing by this change, also the agriculture around the, the, the city itself. Yes, um, I also just want to mention, I, I can see in the chat that a lot of people are asking on the price. And I just want to repeat again that we had the same uh, budget in the kitchen for raw produce or, or raw materials. So we had to do the transformation within the same budget. The only investment we made was by educating people to, to learn them how to cook in a different way. So, so we have done it, done it within the, the boundaries of, of that. Um, I also think it's uh, important to know that, of course, there was used enough money to the, the meals uh, from the beginning. Um, I have uh, in cooperation with Berlin, uh, try to examine some of their meals, and I can see that that they are using, they are they are trying to make make uh, meals for amount so small, so you can't you not be able to do it in the same way. You have to, you have to have some some money to work with. But I would like to show some additional slides if I'm allowed to. Um, that that I think that the principle here is that the learning point is that the professional kitchens could be a driver for this transformation, very much inspired by Olivier de Schutter and his report on the right to food, 
um, where he says it's a democratic choice. We can't leave this uh, discussion to the, the commercial market because uh, they are too focused on lowering the price, uh, mass production. If we want to have uh, and all the, the external, external costs with the mass production are not paid by the, uh, uh, the, the big enterprises, it's paid by the uh, society. Uh, we are the ones getting health problems. We are the ones getting problems with the nature and, and, and not clean, no clean drinking water and antibiotics in our pigs and um, the climate changes. So, as a society and as a, a uh, we have to take a democratic control over this food system. And I think at one one uh, level to do that level to do that is the public kitchens where you can buy. In, in Copenhagen alone, we have um, 40 million euros a year we buy the product for. So by, by ensuring that that product is, is uh, bought by organic um, local farmers, we are making a, a, a different kind of market where the organic price is valued or the organic production line is valued. Um, and, and you can... If, if we are allowed to by the EU Commission or EU legislation, then you can direct these public tenders and public procurement much more precisely into uh, a way to under, um, um, support the farm to fork, the fork to farm um, uh, strategy. Um, these 70,000 uh, 70, meals a day that were converted into 90% um, have have, have meant that we have a organic agriculture in Denmark. And I write in the, the slide that it's 9%. Actually, the numbers just uh, have uh, been um, um, checked again, and it's now 11%. And I think that is almost a, a world record. Um, so so it has a it has an impact that you choose to do this as a big uh, customer in the market. Um, and I think... The, the reason why it's so difficult uh, that we um, that to gain this market power and to to ensure it is that when when the Copenhagen House of Food started their work, we had to negotiate with uh, bureaucratic uh, of, uh, the bureaucratic office of public procurement, and they were only measured by getting the commodities as cheap as possible. So we also had to educate them to say, well, we have to have new measurements for the procurement because we can't teach the people in the kitchen to make uh, food from scratch if it's not possible for them to get the, the, the food from uh, the system. And in Denmark, we have this very clear certification on the organic food, so it's very easy in the public centers to say it has to be organic because we have the, a stamp, a national stamp, and you can say, Either it's organic or not, it's organic. So it's easy in a big um, contract to, to say we want it to be this and this organic. It will be more difficult now when we have to find out how it's also climate friendly, for instance, because it's not that black and white, but it will be looking into. But I really want to show this slide. It's from an IPS uh, report. Uh, so <laughs> Oliver is very familiar with it. And you can see this is a picture of um, which lock mechanism we have in the food, the global food system that makes it so difficult to make a, a change, even though you as a democratic uh, government wants to make a change. And, and especially I want to point out the, the um, expectation of cheap food, because I can see in the chat that people are asking, how did you lower the price for organic food? Because it's 25% more expensive than uh, conventional food. And I think it's very important to say that we didn't. We just started to pay, pay the price and find ways to get, afford it by lowering the, the amount of meats and by lowering the food waste and, and prioritizing it uh, as very important that it wasn't organic. And, and I think it would be very unhealthy for this uh, development if we started from a point of view where we had to lower the price for organic food because that's the whole problem with the food system that we are uh, um, going so uh, direct for cheap food. And then I would like to show just quickly this slide. It's uh, I'm a part of the Food Shift 2030 program. I don't know if you know it, but it's a very big European project. 
and uh, they just uh, announced this uh, this schedule where they said the, the point is that what can city governance do to uh, provide this connection between land and the city and they try to to show all the very important um, things that are have influence on the food system and as you can see the city governance is not part of any of them it's all kind of other uh, levels that you have to do make a change so the, actually in my opinion the only level the city governance has is the is the public procurement and and their own meals to be a customer in the market and start there uh, but i think that's also a very powerful position to have and uh, and then they could start looking at food as a part of their, uh, the, 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 their system, that, they, that it is important for their resilience and the social development, that there is a healthy hinterland for a city. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to do that. And I don't think I have time to, to uh, elaborate on that, but um, it's a very important system. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Um, I think, um, Maybe people can also ask questions to you if they want to know more about how these networks and, um, work. Um, now we are still working on um, a method to get Geneviève into um, this panel, but um, as we have to close at 11.30, I now want to ask if the questions to Armin, um, you wanted to um, tell us a little more on how the Citizens Cooperative of Malls is working together. And um, I also received a question um, uh, from the audience, um, uh, which, which said, I wonder whether there, there was any pushback from the farmers practicing industrial agriculture in the community, or was it mainly from the, uh, from the corporations? So maybe you can also integrate these questions to you in your answer. Wir haben 2016 diese Bürgergenossenschaft gegründet, diese Kooperative, die Comunità, ist der italienische exakte Begriff. Bürgergenossenschaften sind in Italien eine innovative Form des Genossenschaftswesens, wo Menschen nicht für sich selbst etwas erreichen wollen, sondern sich für ein Territorium einsetzen, sich für ein Gebiet einsetzen, eine Gemeinde, eine Region und so weiter. Mhm. Um, so they founded this cooperative in 2016. Um, the Italian word for it is comunita. Um, and this is a special form or an innovative form of cooperatives in Italy where the, um, the stakeholders don't only um, work for themselves but also really advocate for a certain territory. Wir sind überzeugt, dass die Lösungen im Kleinen von unten beginnen müssen dass sie im Lokalen stattfinden und dass sie davon leben, von Menschen, die diese Projekte umsetzen. Mm -hmm. um, we are convinced that solutions have to be found at the ground, they have to be bottom up from the local level um, and it's important to find people or to be based on the people that then also implement these um, ideas. Dass es immer ein Prozess der Kooperation sein muss, Kooperation heißt auch, dass es immer ein lokaler Lernprozess ist, mit Aushandeln, mit Abstimmen, wo man versucht, die eigenen Überlegungen und Handlungen nachvollziehbar zu machen. Mm -hmm. So it's um, a process of cooperation uh, and also a local learning process where you always have to negotiate and kind of find solutions um, together. Und das ist Wichtig ist, die, Trennung, die Trennungslogik der heutigen Gesellschaft aufzuheben, wo alles in verschiedenen Staaten aufgeteilt ist, wo wir dann die Verantwortung für die einzelnen Teile und für die Auswirkungen auf andere Teile nicht mehr sehen. So ist es uns wichtig, in allen verschiedenen Sektoren aktiv zu sein. Mhm. So, um, and this is also to kind of work against this separation logic um, of how usually society is organized now, where you kind of just work in your own sector and you don't really take responsibility for the impacts that your actions have in other sectors. Um, so it's important that we really incorporate this into um, 
the way we work and that we work together to make sure that the impacts um, are considered. Es ist uns wichtig, vom Lokalen auszugehen, von dem, was die Stärke der Region ist. Und um ein paar Beispiele zu, zu nennen, als Bürgergenossenschaft vermarkten wir, vermarkten wir regionale biologische Produkte. Wir betreiben einen Marktstand, wir begleiten Biobäuerinnen, wir haben eine Biodorfsennerei übernommen. Mhm. So, um, we really believe that from the local level we can um, support the strength of the region. So, some of the activities that are do they are doing is that they help in the marketing of regional and organic products. They have a market stand. Um, they really accompany um, farmers um, in their work. Uh, they also have a dairy um, factory um, that is operating on an organic level. Yeah veranstalten Märkte als sozialen Prozess, wir veranstalten Kulturwanderungen, wir begleiten junge Unternehmerinnen, die in der Region aktiv werden möchten und viele verschiedene Projekte in allen unterschiedlichen gesellschaftlichen Bereichen. Okay, so um, they um, organize markets as a social happening, they have um, hikes, cultural hikes throughout the region. Um, they also support um, young entrepreneurs in the region um, and really foster this um, concept in all uh, parts of society, in all sectors of society. Und als einen zentralen Punkt auch, Susan Paulsen hat gesprochen, dass wir eine radikale kulturelle Transformation benötigen. Und Die Kulturarbeit ist auch ein sehr zentraler Baustein der Genossenschaft. Wir veranstalten ein Festival der nachhaltigen Regionalentwicklung, Filme, Dialogabende. So ist die Kulturarbeit eigentlich ein wichtiger Bestandteil, wie wir die Gesellschaft im oberen Finchka weiterentwickeln möchten. Mhm. Okay, um, so... A quote from Susan Paulson says that you really need a radical social transformation as well. So they um, use culture to foster um, sustainable regional development. Um, and the culture work really is the main factor in how they try to progress um, and develop society in the Upper Finchgau. So is this. Unser Anliegen wir versuchen auf allen Ebenen die Gesellschaft im Kleinen zu verändern, weil wir überzeugt sind, dass es viele kleine Laboratorien der Zukunft braucht. Und wir möchten ein solches Laboratorium sein. Okay. So the aim is really to um, foster or to bring to progress um, societal level uh, change on all levels. Um, and they believe that to in order to achieve this, um, you need lots of very small laboratories of the future. And with this initiative, the hope is to be one of these laboratories of the future and to change from in the, on the local level, which then may um, come to the wider societal level. Okay, thanks a lot, Armin. Um, I think you really showed us how your work, you, you work there. And I think this is also um, giving us some pleasure in order to see well, um, it's really something that we can change also the, the agriculture and it's really, um, yeah, um, from the bottom up and also on the really local level. Um, as Genevieve had really uh, huge technical problems because she's living in the countryside, actually it's far easier to participate, uh, to participate in such a conference if you live in the city and have a good internet connection. Um, but now we have her on this mobile, 
and we will try to integrate her via the mobile and give you another four minutes before we stop to yeah, say some more about um, the work of Via Campesina and also um, how the peasant wo voice can be heard in this EU policies of trade policies, um, common agricultural policy and also um, the farm to fork strategy. Um, we will, this is a, just a technical tryout and we will just start now and if you, it's really impossible to listen to her, please write that in the chat. So, Genevieve, the, the word is yours. Yes, sorry again. Well, I'll be very short then, but it's uh, very important to be in the discussion as more peasant mm -hmm. representative and all the work that we are doing on the ground at that country level we have to put it also into public politics and to be present in NATO and also in different uh, places where the global, global policies are discussed. And for the uh, European level, we're working always a lot on the gap, but also now on the farm to fork strategy. Um, like Olivier de Schutter explained, it's a very interesting policy in that sense that it is a global, it's addressing food as something global, something to see in the policy. But in the meantime, uh, it has a lot also of things that are uh, put aside and that not taken into consideration. But it's really our role and our struggle to go, to be considered as stakeholders, small peasant representatives from all over Europe, uh, millions of peasants, and to put forward the idea that really food is not a commodity. Food is really something central in our life. We have to contribute and we are part of the of the story and also innovating at many, many levels. So this is really what we are trying to do and um, making our voice heard in different places, meetings and uh, uh, trying to meet the, the commissioner and also taking part of collective discussions into platforms like the one that was set up after uh, I did uh, uh, work on, 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 on food policy. To, a few years ago, uh, but also uh, bringing, bringing forward our idea of full sovereignty. Full sovereignty is really in Europe about democracy, about being able to decide on what is going to be food, and uh, what will be in our place tomorrow. And we've seen in the discussion that there's a lot uh, going on at the local level, but now we need to make this um, bigger, to scale it up, and to make sure that in every place you have a discussion about what is going to be to be in people's place. And for this it is important that all peasants are included, but also it is the people uh, who are uh, just um, living in different places to make sure that they have decent, decent food. And really for us there's a, a real gap, something really missing in the farm to fork strategy. That is that is the social aspect is very very little uh, access to food to all is not really present, only through the choice of consumers, which is not, uh, which is really not enough. Um, so this is really what we are going to struggle for in the coming years, and also struggling for uh, young farmers being able to to work and to to set up new farms and to provide uh, this change that is really um, visible all over all over Europe. Okay, um, thanks, Shinive. I really sorry. I need to stop you now because we have to um, close this panel in uh, one and a half minutes, and I will just try to uh, also summarize what you said because not everybody could really follow because the quality was not the best. But really, thanks a lot, and I really want to say um, also for the summar summary of this uh, panel that, um, of course, the degrowth discussion um, is um, is one that is pretty much within the universities and uh, what we tried to do in this panel is to bring it to people who are active in all different kinds of fields and, of course, uh, the situation of small-scale farmers um, to participate in such um, an uh, forum is not the easiest as you, uh, you have seen now. But what Genevieve wanted to point out is that it's um, La Via Campesina is uh, building up a network of small-scale farmers to bring together 
to uh, um, to oppose this um, common agricultural policy and trade policy and have common actions in order to um, have a pressure on the these uh, policy levels and also but also trying to meet um, like MEPs and other people within uh, the EU um, policy structure in order to point out that this voice of the small uh, small scale farmers and peasants uh, uh, agriculture is not heard enough. And this is what actually Via Campesina is doing and is also so, is so important. And she said for the far, uh, farm to fork strategy, um, it is that, um, as Olivier already pointed out as well, that the social aspects are really missing and um, we have to um, use it as a, like a, a, a framework that we should, um, of course, refer to, but also push for um, really a more fundamental transformation. And I want to say thanks to all of um, my panelists, also to the audience for listening. Um, thanks to the panelists for sharing what, what you do and, um, and the wonderful work. And now I'm putting in the uh, chat one uh, link. And if you want to um, also want to share, um, uh, to work together on degrowth in the food uh, system, I ask you to tr just register and on this um, um, platform and um, because we will share all the documentation of the whole degrowth conference of all the sessions on food there and we will also ask you to help us with the harvesting process um, and we of course we want to somehow implement a platform there uh, on the issues of degrowing the food system so thanks a lot to all of you also to the technical team um, who supported us in the background and um, there's of course also the room on discord where you can uh, then um, after what like after this session um, also continue to discuss and today there will also be two more workshops where initiatives present themselves um, on uh, different kind of like on different kind of levels where they also try to transform the food system and there are still some uh, places left and uh, if somebody is not registered yet you can ask if you can also join in in this workshop so um thanks a lot to all of you and bye